Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. Suzanne Basso was born on May 15, 1954, in New York. Her parents, Florence and John Burns, had eight children altogether, and out of the three girls born, Suzanne was the youngest. The family struggled, they lived in poverty, and John would physically assault members of his family and drink on a regular basis. Florence was no stranger to handing out physical and emotional damage as well. She grew up around it. Her infamous brother was none other than spree killer Robert Garrow. Florence and her brother Robert lived in a tumultuous household, and Robert himself grew up having issues with paraphilia, being sexually attracted to animals, and he would even go to the farm and use milking machines on his own genitalia. It has been documented that Suzanne was sexually assaulted by female and male relatives, and who knows if her uncle Robert was one of those men. Not into school and needing an escape, Suzanne started smoking cigarettes early on. One day, Florence caught her, and instead of reprimanding her like a normal parent, she made Suzanne eat the whole pack of cigarettes. Even though Suzanne graduated from high school, she never received good marks. After graduating, she had odd jobs working as an office clerk, a seamstress, and a laborer. In the early 1970s, she met a Marine by the name of James Peake. She had her first daughter, Christiana, when she was 19, and her son, James Jr., was born a year later when she was 20. James was busted for taking advantage of Christiana, so he was convicted and sent to prison in 1982. Who knows what was going on in Sue's mind, but everything that she witnessed and endured throughout her life rubbed off on her, and she did the same thing to her children that was done to her growing up. After spending about 10 years in prison, James was released, and Sue took him back. James, Sue, and their two children moved from New York to Houston, Texas, and changed their last name from Peak to O'Malley. In an attempt to rebrand themselves with new identities, they began telling people that they were Irish-American. For work, Suzanne became a security officer for an apartment complex. In 1993, while still married to James and never getting a divorce from him, Sue started dating a man named Carmine Basso. The two fell in love, but because she was unable to marry Carmine, she went to the courthouse to get her last name legally changed from O'Malley to Basso so they could have the same last name. They moved in with each other, and things were seemingly fine between the two. I previously mentioned that Suzanne and James Peake had assumed an Irish identity when they moved to Texas. Suzanne was obsessed with everything Irish, and she was also obsessed with lying and putting up fronts. On October 22, 1995, Suzanne appeared in the Houston Chronicle. She had a quarter page dedicated to her talking about her engagement and how she was one of 12 children and an heiress to a Nova Scotia oil fortune. Her full name in the paper read, Suzanne Margaret Ann Cassandra Lynn Teresa Marie Mary Veronica Sue Burns Sensenslovsky. The announcement also mentioned that she was very educated, having graduated from St. Anne's Institute in Yorkshire, England. She even said that she was an accomplished gymnast and a nun. The announcement mentioned the groom as well, Mr. Carmine Joseph John Basso, not a business owner running a security company, but a Congressional Medal of Honor recipient from the Vietnam War. The announcement in the Houston Chronicle came up to a total of $1,372, but the Houston Chronicle never received their payment from Suzanne. On October 25th, they retracted her announcement and said they were looking into possible inaccuracies. She continued on with her relationship and with her lies. On May 27, 1997, she called the Houston Police Department and asked them to check on her husband Carmine at his office because she had not spoken to him in about a week and was getting concerned. Police went to do a wellness check on 47-year-old Carmine, and police discovered him in his office surrounded by trash cans that had feces and urine in them. There was no bathroom in his office, so they just suspected that he was using the bins for his toilet. An autopsy was conducted, and reports concluded that Carmine died from erosion of the esophagus, and there was a strong ammonia odor in his body. The official cause of death was considered to be from natural causes, though. A mere two months after Carmine's death, Suzanne met a man named Louis Buddy Musso at a church carnival in New Jersey. 
Betty was a 59-year-old who was classified back then and in court documents to have been mentally retarded with the mind of a 7-10-year-old. to 10 year old. He lived in an assisted living center and worked at a grocery store. Suzanne's friend Al Becker was a friend she knew for over 20 years, and Al managed Buddy's social security benefits and was the designated representative payee. Suzanne pretended to be romantically interested in Buddy because she had ulterior motives, but she would be as patient as she could. She lived in Texas, which was far from New Jersey, so she and Buddy had a long-distance relationship for almost a year. In June of 1998, Sue convinced Buddy to leave his family and friends in New Jersey to move in with her near Houston, Texas, so the two of them could get married. Buddy agreed to ditch his job in everything and everyone he knew for his future wife, Suzanne. Wearing cowboy boots, a bandana around his neck, and a cowboy hat, Buddy caught a Greyhound bus and told everyone he was off to be with his lady love. Back in New Jersey, Al was having trouble getting in contact with Buddy. Little did he know, Suzanne was preventing Buddy from speaking to his friends. Al even reached out to Texas state agencies, but no one was able to help him get in contact with Buddy. It was now July 1998, and Sue had been trying for months to designate herself as Buddy's Social Security representative payee. She was unable to do so, but she was able to get life insurance policies out for Buddy, with her being listed as the beneficiary with a base pay of $15,000 but increased to $65,000 if Buddy died from a violent crime and not natural causes. On August 22nd, Buddy would encounter his first run-in with being assaulted. On that summer day, Buddy was assaulted by three men, and Houston police officer Jeff Butcher responded to a report of an assault. When he arrived at the scene, he saw Buddy, along with Suzanne's 23-year-old son James, and a 27-year-old man by the name of Terrence Singleton. The men were running around in the streets. Officer Butcher reported that he noticed the men were running military style. When he stopped the men, he noticed Buddy had two black eyes. Buddy expressed to the officer that he no longer wanted to run and that three Mexicans attacked him. Officer Butcher drove the three men to Terrence Singleton's apartment, where he lived with his 22-year-old fiancé, Hope Athens, her 54-year-old mother, Bernice, and her 25-year-old brother, Craig. Suzanne was also in the apartment at that time, and she told Officer Butcher that she was Buddy's legal guardian and reprimanded James for making Buddy run. She comforted Buddy and made him feel safe while in the officer's presence, which satisfied Officer Butcher enough for him to leave without filling out any paperwork. A few days later, on August 25th, Sue called Buddy's niece and the police department, expressing to them that she was concerned with Buddy and did not know where he was. She expressed that Buddy ran away with, in her words, a little Mexican lady he met at the laundromat. The next day, on August 26th, Buddy's body was found lying in a ditch by a passerby who was jogging in the area. Police and medics were called to the scene, and his body was transported for an autopsy. The autopsy report said that the victim, they still had not uncovered who the victim was, was covered with hundreds of marks from head to toe. There were bruises, broken bones, cuts, burns, lash marks, and more. The report said that the marks were inflicted over a five-day period before his death, and the ultimate cause of death was a skull fracture caused by an unknown object that left a large X mark on his scalp. Before being dumped, his clothes had been changed into brand new fresh clothes. A few hours after Buddy's body was discovered, Suzanne strolled into the Jacinto City Police Department to follow up with her missing persons report. She offered some information and left for her home. When she arrived at her house, Assistant Chief Robert Pruitt was waiting for her. Suzanne was not afraid and allowed Chief Pruitt to come inside of her house where he noticed her son James, a dog, a cat, and two ferrets. It was a small place with one bedroom, but Buddy and James slept in the living room. James had a mattress and Buddy slept on a cot. So much for Suzanne's so-called romantic relationship with Buddy, making him sleep separate from her. Chief Pruitt spoke to Suzanne and James about Buddy and then asked if they would be willing to come with him to identify a body to which they agreed. James verbally identified Buddy's body first and Chief Pruitt asked to speak with him alone. Away from his mother, Chief Pruitt asked James if he knew what happened to Buddy and he casually replied, we killed him. James then communicated with Chief Pruitt and other officers that he knew where some evidence had been dumped and he led them to a dumpster that had gloves, some of Buddy's clothes, and other pieces of evidence. Suzanne was questioned, and knowing that her son James already confessed, 
she decided to confess as well and provide a written statement. She said that she drove her friend Bernice's car around with Buddy's dead body in the trunk and drove it to a site where her son James, Terrence, and Craig dumped the body. She also wrote that she was the one who dumped all of the evidence in the dumpster, but it was Terrence, James, and Craig who actually did the killing. After questioning Suzanne, Chief Pruitt took a trip to visit Bernice because that is supposedly where Buddy was held and killed. As soon as Bernice opened the door for Chief Pruitt, without even saying hello, she said, this is about Buddy, isn't it? She then showed Chief Pruitt an aluminum baseball bat, a wooden baseball bat, handcuffs, and pieces of carpet that had blood on them that they had ripped out and stored in the trunk of her car. Detectives were also able to speak with a neighbor by the name of Bruce Byerly, and he told detectives that he saw Buddy a week before his death and he had a black eye. He asked Buddy if he should call an ambulance for him, but Buddy replied by saying, No, you call anybody and she'll just beat me up again. Poor Buddy had been suffering for a long time at the hands of Suzanne, and Buddy was scared to speak up. Six people were arrested in connection with Buddy's murder. Investigators found out that Buddy was treated like a dog and was forced to clean and do chores and would be assaulted if he moved too slow. They initially believed that Buddy died because he broke a Mickey Mouse ornament at Bernice's apartment, but after more digging, they found out about the insurance policies and a document that was titled The Last Will and Testament which left Suzanne Buddy's entire estate. The document even said verbatim that no one else was to get a cent. James, Terrence, and Bernice signed the document as witnesses, dated in 1997, but the document was actually created on Suzanne's computer on August 13, 1998. Also on Suzanne's computer was a copy of a restraining order that prevented any of Buddy's relatives from contacting him, so Suzanne had concocted lies to allow courts to approve the restraining order. When police searched Suzanne's home, they found a pair of Buddy's pants and in it was a note written by Buddy that was intended for a friend back in his home state of Jersey. Some of the note read, You must get down here and get me out of here. I want to come back to New Jersey soon. Everyone involved in Buddy's murder was charged with capital murder because they held someone against their will and they killed for financial gain. Prosecutors were aiming to get ringleader Suzanne the death penalty. Everyone had a separate trial. James was first to stand trial, and he testified that the whole ordeal with Buddy lasted for a total of five days, and he was in handcuffs most of the time. He said that if they went out to eat at a restaurant, they would keep him handcuffed in the back seat of a car. He was forced to kneel like a dog, and they refused to let him use the toilet if he needed to relieve himself. Being that he was unable to hold himself forever, he would urinate or defecate on himself, and he would be assaulted for that. If he cried, he would be assaulted even more. Although James admitted to taking part in everything he was mentioning, he said that he only did it because he was fearful of Suzanne. He was quoted saying, I didn't know what else to do. I was scared of my mother. From being stuck with lit cigarettes and bathing in kitchen cleaner and bleach, Buddy had to endure so much before they killed him. James said that Buddy was ultimately killed at Bernice's apartment on a child's playmat they had him kneeling on. I also want to make a note that James lived in a fantasy world just like his mother. He lived his life telling people that he was a special operations soldier and he wore military gear every day. He even slept in his military gear. Suzanne's fantasies were okay, but when it came to her son's fantasies, she thought he was crazy and nicknamed him Bozo the <laughs> Clown. At the conclusion of James's trial, he was sentenced to life in prison. For Terrence's trial, he testified that he did use a bat and assaulted Buddy with it. At the conclusion of his trial, he was convicted of capital murder and sentenced to life in prison. For Craig's trial, he admitted that he assaulted Buddy and that Sue was the ringleader and gave everyone instructions. Craig was sentenced to 60 years in prison. For Bernice's trial, she admitted to assaulting Buddy as well but she also said she was convinced to take part in the murder because of Suzanne. For her role in the crime, she was sentenced to 80 years in prison. Hope had a trial as well, and like the previous co-defendants, she admitted to assaulting Buddy because he broke her Mickey Mouse collectible and told her that he wanted her and her mother Bernice to die for what they were doing to him. When it was time for a jury to deliberate on her conviction, there was a hung jury. Because of the hung jury, prosecutors offered Hope a plea deal in exchange for her testimony against Suzanne at her upcoming trial. Hope agreed, pled guilty to murder, and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. 
she received the lightest sentence out of all of the co-defendants. Suzanne was last to stand trial, and the stress was getting to her. Suzanne was once an overweight, 300-plus pound woman when she was initially arrested, but she dropped weight very fast and went down to 140 pounds and was in a wheelchair. She was in a wheelchair because when word got around in prison that she assaulted and killed a mentally challenged man, prisoners wanted their revenge. They gave her a punishment so bad that she became partially paralyzed and needed the wheelchair. When it was time for Suzanne to take to the stand, she said that she was having mental issues. Everyone in court was not hearing the voice of grown woman Sue Basso, though. She changed her voice to sound high-pitched and squeaky like an adolescent. She told the court that she regressed in age and that she was completely blind. Suzanne was reverting back to her old lying ways, and the act put on was enough to have the judge order a competency hearing. After being seen by a court-appointed psychiatrist, they testified that Suzanne was faking her mental illness, so the judge ruled that Suzanne was competent to stand trial. When Hope testified at Suzanne's trial, she said that it was on a Friday, August 21, 1998, when Suzanne and James brought Buddy to Bernice's house and they saw Buddy's black eyes. Buddy told them that he was assaulted by Mexicans when he went out for a walk. She said that Suzanne made Buddy sit on a red and blue kids' mat. Sometimes he would kneel, and sometimes he would be on all fours like a dog. She said that everyone took turns assaulting Buddy at one point. James, who was wearing steel-toed combat boots, began assaulting Buddy with them on. Buddy pleaded for James to stop, and when he did, Suzanne asked him why he stopped, so James continued. Hope also testified that 300-pound Sue would jump on Buddy and pounce on his weakened body. When Suzanne would leave for work, all of the co-defendants would take turns watching Buddy, and they would not let him leave the mat he was kneeling on. They refused to let him make calls as well. After Hope was done testifying, Sue's daughter Christiana also testified against her mother. She was not involved in the murder of Buddy at all, but she said she was not surprised by Suzanne's behavior because she endured a lot growing up at the hands of Suzanne. From sexual to physical assault, she witnessed and experienced it all. It was now August 1999 when Suzanne's trial concluded. She was found guilty of capital murder and she was sentenced to death. After her guilty verdict, Sue began crying and shouted out that she was not guilty. Her daughter Christiana told reporters, Justice has finally been served. She's off the streets. She can't hurt anybody. Let the inmates kill her. I don't care. Sue filed for appeals over the years, but the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals affirmed her sentence in January 2003. In 2014, there was another appeal, and Suzanne's attorneys brought up her mental state. Suzanne complained that she was still paralyzed and said another inmate tried to kill her. She also said that she should be free because she wasn't safe in prison, and an inmate even tried to kill her by giving her a book with a live snake in it while she was in the prison medical room. One of Suzanne's attorneys by the name of Winston Cochran told the court that due to Suzanne being paralyzed, it would cause her to develop a degenerative disease which would make her have delusions. Her attorneys did admit that she had a history of lying and creating elaborate stories but the stories would become much worse once the delusions began. Suzanne then spoke up and admitted that she did lie in past court proceedings when she said she was a triplet, that she worked for the New York governor's office, and that she had an affair with Nelson Rockefeller. A judge denied her final plea for clemency, and her execution date was scheduled for February 5, 2014 in Huntsville, Texas. When asked if she had any last words, she replied by saying, No, sir but a teary-eyed Suzanne did smile at two supporters who were in the witness area. She was executed by method of lethal injection and was pronounced dead at 6.26 p.m. Thank you all for watching another episode of Death Row Executions. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, and subscribe.